Good morning to all of you. Welcome to the National Seminar on Research Ethics. Welcome, ma'am, and welcome, dear participants. So, before we start the seminar, may I request our beloved professor, Dr. Uh, uh, Principal in Charge Kumar Ebenezer, sir, to speak few words about our institutes. Good morning, everyone. So, respected Dr. Uh, Vishwajanani J. Satagiri, madam, the head translational knowledge and digital library and outstanding scientist of CSR in New Delhi, who is the speaker of the day. Uh, most respected colleagues from CARE and other institutes, dear scholars and students who have joined here for this seminar on research ethics. A very good morning to all, and I welcome you all to the National Seminar on Research Ethics organized by Faculty of Allied Sciences, Chetina. At this juncture, I would like to just brief about our institute. So, Chetinad Academy of Research and Education is a deemed to be university under the Act of UGC 1965, uh, sorry, 56, with the vision to offer transformative education, which enables the individual to be a responsible citizen and with a mission to imbibe the values in every citizen. That is, who are undergoing education at the CARE. CARE offers about 74 academic programs in the Faculty of Medicine nursing, allied health sciences, pharmacy, physiotherapy, architecture, commerce, and law. And the coming to the research, research at CARE has a vision and mission to address the key and emerging biomedical problems with implications in human health with the help of talented faculty members, scholars, as well as students. So it supports cohesive research in different trust areas like nanotechnology, biotechnology in diagnostics, targeted drug delivery and vaccination, human genomics, genetic epidemiology in uh, infectious and life cell diseases, native medicine, marine pharmacology, drug discovery, environment, pollution and infection surveillance, bioinformatics and system biology, pathway analysis and diseases, innovation and import substitution and diagnostics, stem cell biology, regenerative medicine, telemedicine and point of care diagnostics in, it, in its wings. So the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences is a constant unit of Chetnad Hospital and Research Institute, which offers around 20 different UG and PG programs that are innovative and address the emerging areas in biomedical sciences and allied health, health science sector with the need or demand for the professional in biomedical science as well as allied health sector. So with well-designed multidisciplinary programs, students gain first-hand research experience through highly innovative projects as a part of their curriculum that often lead to scientific publication and patents. So FAHS has designed the curriculum for all the programs in such a way that every student should be enlightened and thrown with the light of ethics at this level, which might help them in carrying forward the duty of respect for the profession. I'm always happy that I also deal with the ethics paper for our students at the UG and PG level. So what is ethics? When I think about ethics, it is nothing but a fusion of moral principle and self-discipline where there is no written or black and white paper unlike law. Simply thinking about the rules for distinguishing distinguish between, between right and wrong and act according to that particular situation in life especially in healthcare sector, such as we have the golden rule, a code of professional conduct like Hippocratic Oath, which says, first of all, do no harm. That means, you know, in ethical terms, we can say it as non-malficence or beneficent. That is, do good as possible to the extent to as much people we can do. That is in my own words. So it's a part of our daily life and it should be there in every discipline, profession or every field. Most people learn ethics or ethical norms at home, which is the beginning where the family is more responsible. Then at the school level, for example, we used to have moral science classes. And then apart from that, in worshiping places like church, temple or mosques, 
or in any other social settings we used to get we used to get uh, these kind of principles from other people like we get exposure from various instances for example in those days we have guru gurukul where they taught lot of the principles like you know moral principle and self discipline so at present there is no such thing as mentioned earlier happens in our life although most of the people acquire their sense of right and wrong during childhood moral development occurs throughout the life and human beings pass through different stages of growth as they mature so ethical norm means what is that mostly common sense on the other side if you ask why we have many disputes and issues in our society so one possible or plausible explanation of these disagreements is that all people recognize some common ethical norms but interpret apply and balance them in different ways in light of their own values and life experience so that means we are the rule breakers and makers that is how we can take it from here so coming to the topic of the day research ethics as we all are involved in that field there are several reason why is it important to adhere to ethical norms in research research ethics it's not only provides guidelines for the responsible conduct of research it also educate us and monitor scientists conducting research to ensure a highly ethical standard with its principles like honesty objectivity integrity carefulness openness respect for intellectual property rights confidentiality responsible publication and mentoring of students or scholars respect for colleagues non discrimination competence justice equality legality animal and human care and protection which are all the core aspects of ethics this is what we learn from this particular topic it's also emphasize on promoting the values that are essential to collaborative work that is very very need of the hour and accountability to the public and the support of the people and the welfare of the society so with this personal note i hope that this this seminar will emphasize more and open an insight on research ethics with our faculty members scholars students as they all have involved in research work or project even for us at the ug level okay at this juncture i thank our research person dr vishwavani madam for her valuable time for the seminar and also dr shobha narayan ma'am for organizing this event have a good day and thank you all thank you so much sir on behalf of chitnad academy of research and education and faculty of allied health sciences we are grateful and honored and uh, thankful to uh, ma'am and welcome dr vishwajanani j satigari for this national seminar on research ethics and uh, we are really grateful uh, to have you and share your vast knowledge and experience on the various aspects of research ethics so dr vishwajanani is scientist h and head csir traditional knowledge digital library unit since to october 2018 at csir she was also associated with the planning and performance division and later the research project planning and business development directorate here in ma'am handle matters pertaining to strat strategic planning resource planning monitoring and providing decision policy insights and also represented csir in various inter ministerial meetings and forums we are really honored to have you here ma'am so prior to joining csir ma'am was associated with smart analysis a market consultancy firm a new dr drug discovery research ran taxi laboratories limited ma'am was instrumental in progressing a drug candidate rbx 1001769609 uh, to phase 2 clinical trials for chronic obstructive pul pulmonary disease under the glaxo smith klein ranbaxy collaboration ma'am holds a phd from indian institute of science bangalore with specialization in organic chemistry and has held post doctoral positions at the national taiwan university taipei and university of illinois at uh, usa since taking over as head csir tkdl unit 
मैम हैज बीन वर्किंग टूवर्ड्स डिलीवरिंग टू इट्स मैंडेट टी के डी एल एस ए टूल फॉर डिफेंसिव प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ इंडियन ट्रेडिशनल नॉलेज करेंटली पर्टेनिंग टू द इंडियन सिस्टम ऑफ मेडिसिन आयुर्वेदा यूनानी सिद्धा योगा एंड सौरिपा इन एडिशन मैम हैज इनिशियटेड स्टेप्स फॉर एक्सपैंडिंग द स्कोप ऑफ टी के डी एल इनलार्जिंग इंफॉर्मेशन इन द डेटा बेस इन मैम्स वेरियस स्टेंट्स मैम हैज हेल्ड इंटर डिसिप्लिनरी टीम्स कंप्राइजिंग मेंबर्स with diverse disciplines that include msc phd mba mbbs md and mpharm ma'am has 30 research publications and 22 patent applications to her credit we welcome you ma'am thank you so much shubha thank you so much thank you ma'am so welcome to everybody and uh, in fact it is a great pleasure to be talking at the jetnad academy of research and education a very important forum especially on national uh, research ethics uh, thank you so much professor ebenezer for your kind words of introduction and as well as setting the tone for today's uh, research seminar I'll not take much time, so Shubha, can I move on to the presentation? Yes, ma'am. It's clear now. All right. So it is on the screen. Uh, yes, ma'am. Slide show mode. Slide show. Slide show mode. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again for giving me thank this you. opportunity. And thank you, ma'am. It's our yeah. pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I think that Sir Ebenezer had very rightly set the tone for today's talk, right? You know, especially considering that you know ethics need not be you know talked about as a very strange or difficult subject. It should be part of our day-to-day -day life. So in this context, you know, we actually have our national emblem as Satyam Eva Jayati. So we follow the path of honesty and integrity all through our, uh, you know, professional as well as personal lives. So in this context, why are we talking about research ethics and what is the need for talking about research ethics? So what I will be doing in my presentation is, you know, to kind of give you an overview of, you know. Uh, what is the genesis? Why are we laying emphasis on research ethics? Give a few case studies of what misconducts can look like, and what are the guidelines that we have in place in the country, and a few of my personal recommendations on the subject matter. So thanks so much, uh, Shubha, for sharing your uh, code of conduct with me. So it actually it gave me a very you know a, a overview of. What happens at the Chitrangad Academy of Research and Education today? Thanks for it. Thanks, ma'am. Most of the you know participants today are aware of your code of ethics. Okay, it's very well laid out. The guiding principles. I'm just reading it out uh, from your own guidelines. Is behave with independence, honesty, and transparency in all activities. Carry out research and activities that would command respect from the peers. And be open to questioning. So that is kind of giving a transparent uh, nature to the work that is being carried out at CAF. Promote freedom to perform, advance, and disseminate knowledge and ideas, and merit is given due credit. Along these lines, the course that you have put forth are six different courses. One is of course caring. The second one is on the austerity and uh, uh, integrity, and then. Uh, Uh, comes the range of diversity that promotes the uniqueness of every individual. Uh, the fourth one is on the excellence, which provides for professional growth, improvement, and understanding. Uh, the last two are important from my presentation perspective, which is on ethics in research and ethics in governance, because I'll be covering a large part of it. And this particular uh, these particular codes are for responsible code of conduct. Uh, especially towards you know violation of uh, good conduct that is scientific misconduct and conflict of interest during decision making so here you know why as i had mentioned why will we assume that this should be an innate nature where ethics is given prime importance in our everyday life but still there are cases of misconduct yeah. so when uh, the reason why we are talking about research ethics and research integrity is of the because of the cases that we see uh, where misconducts underlies the publications and even research communications so the concern here is that when you know there was a recent article from the dmc medetics where they have uh, assessed close to about 14000 uh, different articles were identified and out of that uh, they could uh, boil down to about 388 unique items 
if you look at it the medical and health uh, sciences form the most uh, larger part of the uh, issues related to the misconduct almost close to about 81% followed by the natural sciences which is about uh, 12%. The rest of it is, though not uh, near, is uh, to a smaller extent. But when we are talking of scientific publications per se, because the uh, uh, other one is all about, you know, even I, uh, you know, news articles, reports, and many other things. But when we are talking, focusing on only research publications, and as was Imago, the natural sciences and the health and medical sciences constitute a large part of the misconduct. So the concern here is that, you know, while we assume that everything is going fine, there are cases that some things have not gone right. So we need to take corrective action. So if we are looking at uh, this is a worldwide scenario, is this prevalent in India? And the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, if you look at uh, the reports uh, from news articles as well as uh, even scientific uh, articles, then you see the uh, prevalence of research misconduct in Indian science and technology is also very high. There are papers that have been retracted. The, uh, uh, research misconducts not, uh, are not pertinent only to plagiarism, that is copying the textual matter, but is also related to data manipulation and as well as duplication of images and many more. I guess most of you might have recently heard about the NCPS retraction case where there have been allegations of, uh, uh, you know, the, um, uh, of uh, uh, data fabrication and manipulation in, uh, from a leading uh, professor from the institute. Uh, there was a lot of blame game going around uh, with the students and the postdoctoral fellows also being implicated in the case. And of course, the professor herself. This causes a lot of uh, hardship, not only for the uh, concerned people, because if in case you have alleged to have, uh, you know, conducted misconduct, then you have actually not, it actually leads to a lot of unethical, uh, uh, you know, complaint against a particular individual. And uh, I think when uh, uh, Professor Ebenezer had also mentioned about discrimination, this again forms a very, very critical point of uh, research ethics because, uh, uh, you know, immaterial of the gender, the past, the creed, I think uh, uh, one needs to pursue research uh, and as well as ethics in education and research because this is the foundation on which we can grow and provide a good, uh, uh, you know, future for our youngsters. And here is a case that, that had come recently as of November 22nd uh, in uh, science. And this is about the Max Planck uh, director uh, being discriminated and she was actually removed, demoted from her uh, position. The allegation was that the female leaders are judged more harshly and uh, there are more leadership shortcomings in women compared to their male counterparts. So this is an allegation which is being looked into. I think uh, the entire world is looking forward to see, looking into the investigation and understanding what would have gone wrong in this case. Uh, so while this is a glimpse of, you know, the uh, typical uh, misconducts that happen, how is it research misconduct defined? Okay, so I have adopted this particular definition from our own CSIR guidelines for ethics and research and governance. And it is about the violation of both of scholarly conduct and ethical behavior in professional research and governance. So here we are restricting ourselves to only the professional behavior because uh, we assume that even in our personal behavior, much of these aspects are duly covered and uh, uh, are uh, taken care of. So when you're talking of, you know, why is uh, research ethics important, I would like to, you know, quote John H. Sir on the foundations of integrity in research and what would be the core values and guiding norms. Here he says that science and its application are necessary for the advancement of knowledge from which society may benefit. So every work that we do has a connect to the society and that is where our science derives immense importance towards addressing national and global goals. So when uh, you're talking of research ethics, what he also goes on to add is that scientists possess no rights beyond those of other citizens, except those necessary to fulfill the responsibility arising from the special knowledge and from the insight arising from that knowledge. 
So this actually puts us in place saying that, you know, we are not to be treated anything special compared to any other citizen in the country. And in this context, the ethics that we follow lays a foundation for all our future growth. So while this is the case, what is it that has been, you know, uh, kind of disturbing the ethical behavior of science and technology? And here on this particular slide, I guess it's a very busy slide, but it actually, you know, kind of points out to inappropriate research practices. So, you know, it could, one could go into the embezzlement of ideas. Here, the embezzlement of ideas is not restricted to only research publication. It could be even in cases of where, you know, many of our professors and uh, faculties become part of the committees, maybe internal committees or external committees, and you are reviewing the research proposals of others. Okay, Or maybe you're sitting in a particular committee where you're assessing the progress of students, the research uh, progress. And there you identify ideas that you can copy and you use that without giving credit to the uh, owner of that particular uh, uh, research idea. And then you go about doing your research. This is all called stealing or embezzlement of ideas. And this is to be treated as the inappropriate research practice. The very often uh, research misconduct is uh, largely linked to plagiarism. So I said, as I had mentioned, plagiarism is largely a copying text. It could be from your own article or it could be from other articles. It could be even, you know, uh, uh, copying uh, data from others, okay, and you're putting that into your research article. In today's context, there are a lot of software tools that can detect plagiarism and tell you where exactly you have copied to what extent you have copied data. The next very important point is on the falsification data or results and fabrication. These are all amount to fraud. So falsification of data is, you know, in an anxiety to prove that your research has gone well and to meet the expectancy that, you know, this is what I had envisaged from my research, research and this is the result that I got. You fabricate data, you put in incorrect uh, uh, numbers or even results and then say that, you know, your research has produced what you had expected, your, what you had hypothesized. So this is a very, very gross, uh, inappropriate misconduct and this should be dealt very severely. The other uh, yeah, research in, uh, inappropriate research practice is on redactant salami publications. Typically, it had been in the case where, you know, uh, much of our promotions and uh, maybe even research uh, scholars uh, recognition comes by the number of publications that we produce. So in this context, what we do is that say we do an experiment, we divide that into maybe two or three parts and then send it out for publications, which by in itself may not have much meaning unless you pull it all together and then publish the paper. Despite that, there are cases that, you know, research scholars and uh, uh, including the faculty have done that, researchers have done that, and this will be treated as an inappropriate research practice. I will be talking about authorship in the next slide in more detail greater details, but yet again, authorship also leads to a lot of hardship in, this, in uh, arriving at whether a particular research group has followed appropriate research or ethical practice or inappropriate practice. Uh, again, from a governance perspective, when we are withholding data for validation or even communication to the higher authorities, this will be treated as a research inappropriate uh, practice. And uh, this is, you know, this can be uh, in terms of examples that I can give us that say you do some research, okay, and uh, you do not communicate the entire results to your higher ups and uh, you withhold some of the data. Similar is the case with any research article. This would all be resulting into unethical practices. And the other very important point when we are talking of all these, you know, inappropriate research practices. Mm -hmm. of research mm -hmm. misconduct is in terms of, you know, wrong or fraudulent paper. So here the distinction comes here in the sense that, you know, say, for example, uh, one of your senior professors has done some research a few years back. 
based on the resources that had been available at that point of time, he or she had looked at the results and had inferred something from that paper. In today's context, where there is a high advancement in terms of science as well as technology, we do the uh, same experiment a little differently and then we infer different results. So the earlier paper is not a fraudulent paper, there's no fraud associated because based on the resources that have been made available at that point of time, the results, uh, suitable inference had been drawn. In today's context, the inference may vary from the earlier. So this should not be treated as a fraudulent paper. So that may be kept in mind. The very, very important uh, misconduct that comes uh, is in terms of the conflict of interest. The conflict of interest could be in terms of decision making. Say, for example, I am in a committee where my own student is being assessed. Okay. And I speak very favorably to the committee, and the committee is drawn by my uh, statements that will amount to conflict of interest. Similar is the case where, you know, uh, a uh, person who has been associated with a particular client, okay, and offers to you know provide who offers to provide supplies to the particular institute, okay, and that particular member is part of the committee. This would lead to potential conflict of interest. These are certain of the things that somebody that every one of us needs to keep in mind that we need to avoid any potential conflict of interest in a professional uh, functioning. Uh, the other very important point I mean, which I'd like to draw your attention is on the p-hacking because uh, at Kid, as I understand, there are a lot of uh, research, there's a lot of research that is being pursued in terms of biomedical uh, activities. So in this context, uh, p-hacking is about, you know, you do a large trial, I'm just giving you an example, uh, say about uh, 1,000 uh, subjects, okay? But uh, when it comes to uh, you know deriving the statistical significance, you include only a part of it, maybe about 300 or 400, just to get to the statistical significance. This will be treated as a research misconduct. The next one is on the hypothesizing after the results are known. So very often when you are doing exploratory research, as many of us who have joined here are all you know, into early research, uh, we have a certain hypothesis in mind. We plan our experiment based on the hypothesis that is there. And uh, thereafter, we derive certain results and then we draw an inference. But when we are publishing our research article, we kind of, you know, say that particular result is or inference is very different from what you had hypothesized earlier. There are cases where the researcher, you know, kind of says that whatever he has actually inferred after the experiment is the hypothesis on which he had actually started the experiment. This, although in smaller uh, numbers, it, is still an inappropriate research practice and will be treated as a scientific misconduct. Yeah, the next one is the very, very important one that is expectancy effect by experimenters. And here, I think, as I had mentioned about the NCBS case, if you know people have read the uh, news articles uh, that had come up on that, uh, they said that that particular student who had indulged in data fabrication or data manipulation was doing it to meet the expectations of the supervisor. Okay? This is a gross scientific misconduct. And uh, another case uh, uh, on this, uh, or example of this expectancy effect is uh, exemplified by, uh, uh, you know, um, by this particular uh, case where a professor identifies, say about, you know, 20, he uh, identifies a set of 20 students he divides them into a batch of uh, two, okay, 10 each. He takes them to the uh, laboratory and he shows them two sets of mice. And he says the first set of mice has, has a you know, very uh, different uh, 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 neurodegenerate, not neuro neurodegeneration. It, it has a very different uh, set of uh, you know, perceiving things, uh, whereas the second one has a different set of perceiving things. He tells that, you know, the second group of animals is the one that is faster, okay? And whereas the first one is slow to recognize and will take a longer time. 
so he kind of primes the students into what uh, uh, you know these animals are all about and what is the likely result that they are going to get by doing the experiment at the end of the experiment the students they you know identify their own results they put the, everything together and then submit it to the uh, to the professor the professor goes through all the inferences drawn and he actually sees that you know the set of students who have been identified with the first set conform to what he had primed them about saying that, that they are the slower animals whereas the second set of students all say that you know those set of animals actually you know cater to the expectancy of the uh, information primed by the professor in fact these are the same set of animals that have been put forth it is just about how we prime the mind of the researchers to kind of conform to what you expect them to do and this when it leads to inappropriate results will be treated as a scientific misconduct uh, the next very inappropriate research practice is about fake reviewers and body systems say for example i do some research and then i identify one of my friends to provide uh, the uh, to be the reviewer of my article and my manuscript gets uh, approved uh, then in that case it is a misconduct similar is the case with fake reviewers there have been cases in the country as well where uh, you know the same person who has submitted the proposal uh, created a fake name and a fake email id and wrote to the editor that the research article can be sent to that kind of, uh, you know person the editor unaware of the background sends the research article to the new person and in fact it is the same person who has submitted the research article so let us all understand that you know while we may indulge in inappropriate or bad unethical research practice at some point of time it would surface so i think as uh, professor ebinez has mentioned it should be an innate nature of following ethical practices in our daily life i have talked about stealing papers the next very important thing that very often the researchers do is on citation manipulation they say you know here there is both the self citation as well as body citation you tell your friends to cite your articles and you cite his or her articles similar as a case when you keep self citing your own articles just to get to the appropriate citation numbers in all of the research misconducts bias constitutes a very very important part and here it could be gender race person etc this will be a very i mean a very unacceptable research practice which needs to be avoided at all fronts here uh, when i'm talking of gender let me be very clear that you know when there is a bias towards a particular gender this will be treated under the unethical research practices whereas that in cases of harassment especially sexual harassment we have an act in place in the country and it will be treated under that and uh, all research institutions need to ensure that we have both ethics committee and as well as the complaints committee the internal complaints committee for addressing such matters the other important part of uh, the inappropriate research practice is not is on sec not securing permissions and authorizations especially related to copyrighted material and also in terms of pre and prior informed consent or statutory regulatory approvals say for example if you are doing the uh, research in animals you need to make, make sure that you have the approval of the ethics committee meant for that uh, animal studies similar is the case for the clinical trials on humans when you, are, you have to take the uh, uh, approval of the institutional ethics committee or the concerned uh, regulatory bodies such as the pcg and others um, make sure that you do not publish your articles in predatory journals this is the list of predatory journals is uh, provided by the ugc please ensure that before you submit your manuscript to any journal you are looking that up and then ensuring that you are sending it to the right journal while we are at research we also need to make sure that we do not infringe upon the ipr as well as non ipr materials published by others so a thorough prior art search that is literature known prior to our research needs to be looked into before we even begin our experiments and research 
breach of agreement or MOU, breach of privacy and data policies all constitute research uh, inappropriate research practices and will amount to unethical behavior and misconduct. Please ensure that you know these are all not uh, uh, done. And here, as I had mentioned, much of the art, you know. Uh, talk, uh, items that I have mentioned on this particular slide are not related to only research publications. It can be uh, with rela uh, related to engagement of project staff. It could be related to pro uh, you know, processing of research proposals, granting projects, funding, and many more. So all of this you know, constitutes ethical research behavior, and I think one needs to follow that. I did mention that I will be speaking about authorship because this is a very, very contentious issue. Very often, uh, uh, you know, what we assume as, you know, we could be a potential author in a research article, that it doesn't seem the case. And uh, uh, often uh, people are either omitted or included in, and in the papers. So here authorship has been defined uh, as uh, the creator or originator of an idea or the individual or individuals who develop and bring to fruition the product that disseminates intellectual or creative works. Let me be very clear that this authorship is not equivalent to the inventorship on patents. Inventorship on patents has a legal connotation, so if there is a definitive definition for that, and one needs to look up that. So when here we are talking of publications and authorship, the minimum requirements for authorship is that there should be a substantial contribution to the work that has been done, the accountability for the work that was done, and its presentation in a publication. So very often when a research article has been cited to have some you know, gross misconduct, very often the corresponding author or the author who is involved in the communication is the one who is you know, uh, really uh, found the culprit. That's not good to be the case because every author listed in that particular research article should be responsible for all the information that has been put in the research article. So it is important for the authors to know, understand, and adhere to the criteria of authorship. And I think in fact, much of the publications journals these days define you know, who should be the authors. Very often, you know, so people get uh, discouraged, but uh, there is always an option to acknowledge the contribution of someone through uh, the acknowledgements. Uh, and here, uh, this includes, you know, people who have supported the study, who have done general mentoring, collecting data, maybe acting as a study coordinator without contributing intellectually in or even, you know, uh, significantly to the particular work. The general issues that you see in authorship is on omission of authors, inclusion of inappropriate authors, that is authors who are unrelated to the work, non-contributing, it could be ghost authors, it could be guest authors, gift authors, honorary doctors, especially when their work is being sponsored by somebody, they may insist of including a KL also in the authorship. Just be aware that these would all amount to scientific misconduct. The other very important point when we are talking of authorship is on prolific authorship. Uh, one I had earlier mentioned that is, you know, you divide a larger research uh, activity into smaller parts and publish multiple number of papers. So you become a prolific author that way. The other one is in terms of the heads of the departments or heads of institutions gaining an authorship in every research article or patent that goes out of their uh, uh, institution. This will amount to uh, misconduct and it will be treated as an inappropriate research practice. I did mention about the gender bias. This is also prevalent in the case of authorship. Uh, a, a particular case, uh, of interest would be about uh, project staff who had been involved in research articles, but you know, goes off on maternity leave during which period the manuscript is prepared and the entire group forgets to include her as the author. So this will amount to inappropriate research uh, behavior. Please ensure that ethical behavior is followed in all aspects of our professional life. When I look at the retraction in India, there are 101 plus uh, reasons why research uh, articles are withdrawn. And uh, I will not be reading out everything, but to it, it kind of tell you that uh, you know, 
there are organizations, there are institutions, there are the individuals who look at all the work that is being published. And uh, here one needs to be aware that we are being watched. If not our innate nature, we need to abide by, you know, the principle of being supervised and ensure that ethical practices are put in place. Uh, I'll quickly walk you through some of the case studies to kind of highlight what could be the research misconducts that have happened. And it is not limited to either of the, I mean, to any one gender. It is across both the genders. The first case is of David Baltimore. He's a Nobel Prize winner in physiology and medicine in 1975. He, at that point of time, when this uh, misconduct surfaced, he was an associate professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And uh, the research work was primarily done by an associate professor at Tufts University, assistant professor at uh, MIT in the year 1981. They published a cell paper, and uh, this is on the endogenous genes mimicking the uh, transgene. So this was supposed to be a breakthrough achievement uh, or uh, uh, discovery at that point of time. And the cell paper is published and they get a lot of uh, viewership and recognition through this paper. However, the same year in June 1986, a researcher from the group of uh, uh, Teresa Imakari, uh, she finds problems and accuses uh, Imani Shikari of fabricating the data they see that there is a lot of issues with the reproducibility of the experiments. A complaint is filed, okay? The cell paper is subjected to a lot of allegations and it is withdrawn, it is retracted. In 1991, that is uh, almost five years after the, uh, uh, the complaint is filed, uh, the Office of Scientific Integrity debars uh, Imani Shikari for falsifying data and she is also debarred from receiving research grants for about 10 years. She moves to the Tufts, the Tufts University during this time and then she has a lot of difficulty in getting grants for the research that she proposes to do. So she files a review case with the US Department of Health and Human Services and they review the case from 1996 onwards. And uh, thereafter, uh, after following all the investigations, Imani Shikari was fully exonerated of the charges. But just look at the time, 1986 to 1996, 10 years, it is because of not having proper lab notebooks, not being able to record the data properly of the experiments carried out, and the irreproducibility of the experiments, you know, one had to go through this kind of hardship. <laughs> The next case, especially related to biomedical uh, research, is <clears throat> the case of Werner Bestwada. He is a senior professor of hematology and oncology from Johannesburg, South Africa. And here in 1999, he reports the high efficacy for the use of uh, you know, high dose chemotherapy and stem cell in the treatment of women with high risk breast cancer. The results are so notable that he actually finds significant trade differences between the relapse free survival and also the overall survival. However, I know this is, was in complete contrast to two similar studies done by the National Cancer Institute of uh, the USA. So all the results are presented at the ASCO meeting and uh, the SCI then commissions an independent audit date. So when they went to go, when they went about, you know, auditing the records at the uh, University of Witwatersrand, uh, and uh, they see that no medical records are available for several patients. And uh, it, this includes about 20% of patients on high dose chemotherapy. Where records were available, even the eligibility criteria was not met. And also taking prior in contrast, and that's critical in any clinical trial, even that was not taken. And it was also not approved by the University Human uh, Research Oversight Committee, that is the Institutional Ethics Committee that I had mentioned. So this is a serious breach of scientific honesty and integrity. And this professor, senior professor was removed from all university pos positions thereafter. 
for people who are associated with organic chemistry, Leo Beckett is a well-known name. He is an internationally acclaimed professor for his work on Dodica Hedri way back in 1982. He comes from a very well-renowned institution that is the Ohio State University. This professor, being on part of the several research committees, uh, happens to have plagiarized material from a researcher's grant application and used it in his own. Not only did he stop with that, uh, he actually plagiarized information from a grant proposal in an ACS paper without attributing the credits to the concerned author. So the punitive actions taken against him was that he was debarred from receiving federal grants he was debarred from participating in any peer review uh, uh, committees. He was also you know, debarred from serving on the public health service committees. And every proposal submitted by Leo Fakat would have to be certified by the university. So this is the case of Ibn, uh, but yet again, a well-renowned uh, uh, research. The next is a case study of two research uh, professors from the University of Manchester, UK. And uh, they are uh, professors who are colleagues from the adjacent flows. So uh, this is a, a case when in uh, February 2017, Mills, one of the professor, uh, informs the other, that is Layfield, about uh, you know a single molecule magnet, that is the disproposed helium complex. But he doesn't explain the details, but he says that he is all working on towards uh, uh, creating this particular magnet uh, material, this complex. The same day, what he uh, lately, after hearing to whatever nurse had to tell him, he informs his researcher about how to go about creating this complex. So in March 2017, nurse completes his work. He sends his uh, paper to Nature. They accept it. But how it is published only in August 2017, because Nature takes its own time. In early May, Layfield also completes his work on the same complex, okay, and he uh, sends his uh, paper to Amwante Kemi, which is uh, published in June 2017. It is only when the student of Mills who's working on this particular complex identifies this Amwante Kemi paper, he goes and reports it to Mills, and then the complaint is filed, the investigation proceeds, and Layfield is found to have committed two uh, forms of research misconduct, one, fully being aware of Mel's research, he, with the intention of beating his uh, colleague for publication, he does not give credit. The other one is that in today's context, every public journal has the author's disclosure. We need to inform the editor of the other manuscripts that we have sent across to any other place, either accepted, submitted, or soon to be submitted, if it has a bearing on the concerned manuscript under reference. So whatever I have showcased so far are all about research professors and all that. Uh, let me tell you that it does not uh, limit to only the faculties uh, in, uh, involved in research and development. Uh, it also, you know, uh, the research misconduct is also uh, done by prospective fellows and research uh, scholars. And here is the case of the Armando Cordova from the Scripps Research University as well as the Stockholm University, again, well renowned institutions. And uh, this postdoctoral fellow, without informing the uh, supervisor, goes and then submits his uh, research article to a paper as a single author without giving due credit to the senior author and the paper gets uh, accepted. However, the senior author notices it and then he, he, he goes and informs the uh, uh, journal about the misconduct, the paper is withdrawn. This guy moves from the Script Research Institute, moves on to Stockholm University, yet again publishes the same paper. The supervisor being aware of this uh, nature of this postdoctoral fellow follows up the, uh, his work and then again, yet again complains. Uh, uh, so the investigations are conducted, lab notebooks are examined, and he's found guilty of unethical behavior. Uh, the next case is of Bengu Sison, and she's a research scholar who seems to have engaged in fabrication of uh, data, falsifying NMR data, bad record keeping, lack of experimental reproducibility as well as scientific misbehavior in the lab. Uh, Why, uh, you know, they had, in fact, the Office of Research Integrity found 21 different uh, kinds of misconduct conducted by this girl. 
and uh, this is both knowingly and intentionally falsifying and fabricating data, plagiarizing data, and uh, among many other things. She was entered into a voluntary exclusion agreement for five years. And after five years of the PhD being awarded in 2006, in 2011, the PhD was retracted. Uh, so these have all been the cases that I have mentioned. So as you can uh, would have seen, uh, there is no distinction between uh, the genders, nor about the positions. It could be a very senior uh, professor, or it could be a young business scholar. Everyone has indulged in some form of research misconduct or the other. Uh, this is one particular example I will give at this talk in the case studies. This is about John Finn, yet again a Nobel laureate in chemistry in the year 2002. And this is about, uh, he is from the Yale uh, University, and uh, this is about a patent dispute. Uh, so in 1989, uh, Penn, uh, he, he has done, you know, extremely good work on the electron spray ionization of, uh, for analysis of large molecules. So when he I, I know, kind of advises him to file a patent and all that, he downplays this entire scientific uh, work and says there's not much of commercial value, blah, 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 and it goes on. But how in 1992, he applies for a patent, he is granted the patent, and not only does he stop there, he, uh, he actually files it as I mean, the patent is filed with him as an assignee. Typically, when we are doing research in any uh, institution, the assignee is the organization. You know, in my case, it would be the CSAR. In your case, it would be the CARE. Okay, and in his case, it should have been the university. However, he the uh, assignee given to the patent is himself. He licenses the patent to a company, and this is a company that he has co-founded. And not only that, it does the story stop there. This company that he co-founded sublicenses that particular patent to other instrument makers. They make a lot of money with that. Okay, so after a few disputes are uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, uh, not very good communication between uh, this Nobel laureate and Yale University. He moves to Virginia Commonwealth University and uh, he is retired by Yale University. Only in the year 1993, Yale discovers the patent because a third party approaches the university to license this patent. Uh, so they come to uh, realize that they know this guy, John Penn, not only has filed the patent, he has made himself as the assignee and he's also licensed it to his own company. While all this is happening, Fenn files a lawsuit against Yale saying that, you know, they are misappropriating his uh, uh, innovation. So then it goes, matter goes into the court in 2005. Fenn is convicted of civil theft. He is ordered to pay $1 million towards royal fees and legal fees. And not only that, the court uh, provides a verdict that the patent needs to be transferred to Yale University. So this is yet again a case of research misconduct. So we have been talking a lot about, you know, what is it, you know, what risk misconducts can, how misconducts can happen, what are inappropriate research practices and all that, and how does it affect our uh, research and development now and in future? Let me just give you one example of that. If you look at this particular slide, these are the top 10 most, uh, you know, uh, you know, papers that have been retracted and are most cited even after that. So if you look at the last two columns, these are the citations before retraction and these are the citing ideas after retraction also. So you can understand that, you know, if we publish something which is incorrect, there are thousands of viewers who have looked into our study and are using this as a basis for their further research. Any misconduct, any fabrication of data becomes a foundation for future research. And that's the reason we need to exercise ethical practices in our professional work. So when we are talking of all this, of course, one is awareness of you know what can go wrong and how it can go wrong. While awareness is an important factor, uh, there, there needs to be you know, regulations and guidelines in place. Even if it is to kind of prevent the 10% of people or maybe uh, lesser than that number of people who indulge in such uh, malpractices. So if you look at, you know, the guidelines that have been issued in the country, I'm just giving you the 
uh, more, more prevalent ones or the most well recognized ones. One is the University Plans Commission, that is the UGC. They have a gazette that has been published, particularly focused on plagiarism. When you have ethical guidelines from biomedical research in human participants, uh, that has been issued by the ICMR. So anybody who is indulging in biomedical research needs to ensure that these guidelines are followed. The Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India has also you know, published a draft national policy on a, uh, academic ethics, and it covers a whole range of topics such as teaching and research, purity of data, publications, safety and environment, bias and discrimination, publication interaction and outreach, science administration and role of whistleblowers. And uh, there's a very wonderful paper uh, by the INSA, that is the Indian National Science Academy uh, on ethics in science education, research and governance. This is also publicly available on the internet. Whoever is interested, I would uh, you know, request you to please go through it. It uh, kind of you know, gives us a, an idea as to what and how things can actually go wrong when it is also not intended to go wrong. Uh, in CSI are also considering the uh, uh, you know complaints received and uh, even the very small number of uh, misconducts that have happened so far or that has come to our purview, we have also issued guidelines. And again, this is a very, very detailed guideline and it is available on our website. It covers all the issues, what is scientific misconduct, what are good science practices, how do we deal with misconduct, and you know what is ethics and governance and what is conflict of interest? How do we take care of all these matters? Not only that, we have also kind of you know given at what level of misconduct, what should be the punitive action to be taken? So this is you know a, a very well uh, uh, drafted guidelines to ensure that the ethics of highest standard is followed in the CSIR. What we have also done is that we have you know uh, ethics officers. And we also had the Standing Ethics Committee at the CSIR. We also have, uh, uh, you know, the scientific investigation boards constituted for each of our 38 laboratories. All this information is put on our website, including the guidelines. This is to ensure that we are transparent and we are uh, well uh, you know, aware of the concerns on, uh, you know, malpractices at CSIR. And there is also uh, in a preventive as well as corrective actions being taken by the CSIR. And uh, to begin with, what we have done is that once the guidelines were issued, and we have also kind of drafted a declaration form just to make sure that every person uh, who's associated with the, science, uh, the research, uh, be it uh, the regular employee or be it the contractual staff, they all have read the guidelines, are aware of the guidelines, and they have declared that you know they would follow the guidelines in letter and spirit. So this is the declaration form that we have suggested. And not only that, from the CSIR headquarters, we collect the data of all the CSIR labs in terms of the ethical practices and the complaints received for every quarter. And this is submitted to our DG CSIR, which is for uh, uh, usual and necessary action. Uh, so I come to almost a close of my talk. Uh, the recommendations that I would like to make, especially based on our experiences at CSIR, is that we need to have specific guidelines on research ethics. As I had mentioned, there are quite a few in our country, uh, maybe CARE could adopt or maybe may draft one of its own. And uh, also in CSIR, we have the ethics officer, safety officer, and also the relevant institutional ethics committees. It's not related to the animals and human ethics committees. This is on the uh, science ethics. So these are the different committees and uh, maybe care can uh, you know, constitute such committees and all the details need to be made available on the website for anyone to access such information. Every scientist, as I had mentioned, technical officer, project staff, students all associated with research and development should read the guidelines and declare that uh, they have understood the matter and shall abide by the guidelines. Heightened awareness is key for everything in today's context. Uh, we should start with the students, so perhaps including students' seminars, quizzes, talks, etc. by students would be important to inculcate the habit of ethical uh, behavior in professional life. Extensive trainings are required, not just to students and researchers, but also to the faculty. 
proactive measures need to be taken, both corrective and preventive actions, based on it, uh, issues that have been observed to date and what is required as we move forward. Uh, implementation of e-lab notebooks, if possible, should be implemented because this is key to ensure that at least part of the data that is in terms of data fabrication, data falsification, and such things do not arise. Uh, last but not the least, mentors for students and faculty are important, but should not limit to only the students. Uh, so here I would like to close by you know quoting Swami Vivekananda, saying that we, what he says is that we want that that education by which character is formed, strength of the mind is increased, the intellect is intellect is expanded, and by which one can stand on one's own feet. So if this is the foundation of ethics by which we in, by which we inculcate education. Uh, if in case there is any case of uh, misconduct, let me assure you by again quoting uh, William Broad and Nicholas Wade saying that every one case to surface every few months for the public credibility of science to be severely damaged. It's not just science, the institution and the country would also be severely damaged should such misconducts happen in our country. So exercising research integrity is a mandatory context for every one of us to follow. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. I, I can take questions. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so participants can start, can ask ma'am if you have any clarifications on various aspects of uh, research ethics. And uh, there is two, there are th two to three questions on the chat box, ma'am. Uh, in most of the journal, they ask minimum three to five reviewers with reason. It is the journal editor in chief to consider whom to send. If the mentioned reviewer is friend and uh, sends over there, how the author is in fault? See, this is about when <clears throat> the editor asks you suggestions. Okay, you know who your friend is. You should not suggest such a name. You should have somebody who is completely impartial. Even if somebody is critical of the research that you are doing, suggest his or her name because you will get good feedback. One needs to be taken it as not criticism, but as a critical feedback for one to improve and move forward. But here we cannot suggest a reviewer as a friend. A friend as a reviewer. Uh, well, actually, I will. Uh, I am the person who asked the question. Uh, like the, the issue was like uh, most of the journals because uh, uh, many journals where I am keeping, they are asking for the reviews, and we cannot search for every time for many people as a, to keep as a reviewer. And number two was like uh, whenever they have very clearly mentioned in their uh, like journal page also that the reviewer which you are submitting may not be uh, scrutinizing your paper. They have they have mentioned that one. And uh, because uh, uh, it, it, like they they want reviewer for for the purpose of some other review paper, not our paper. So based on these uh, like uh, uh, the information which is provided in the website, then only we are quoting our friends actually. Because like uh, we uh, uh, maximum we will know only twenty to thirty people in a particular field who are expertise. And uh, luckily or unfortunately. They are the uh, best person in that field also, and they are our friends also. That is the issue I asked this question about. Yeah, so let me clarify yeah, by saying that you know, when a reviewer asks for uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, suitable names, okay, you are not supposed to mention the names of your friend. So here, let me clarify, a friend is different from a person whom you know. Say, for example, if you are saying nanotechnology and there is a small group of nanotechnology from across India who you keep in meeting very often, a person is known to you, but a friend is somebody is a little more than who, who is known to you, okay? So in that case, you do not suggest the name of your friends, okay? If in case it is not relevant to your paper, okay, and they are asking you names in general, that's a different matter. But if in case you're submitting your manuscript and in that context you are suggesting names, please ensure that your friends are not suggested as reviewers. That is, that will be treated as an uh, inappropriate research practice. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, example, uh, examples of cases you have shown, 
uh, one part participant wants to know whether keeping photo photos of the particular uh, particular candidate will will it permit or will it will it come under the ethical purview yes these are all published cases of research misconduct where the punitive action has also been given so in that case we can use but if in case it is just an allegation and the investigation is not complete in that case we should not uh, you know kind of mention uh, this whatever i have cited is with appropriate uh, uh, you know references and only in those cases where the case is complete i have mentioned other than for that one single case of Uh, the lady director from math max mike in science where science magazine itself has given the picture and uh, he had this doubt because in dissertation uh, it's advised to not to keep patients or participant photos Yes, that is uh, you know ethical practice. You, when you are taking a free and fair informed consent for doing any kind of human studies, you are laying out the guidelines by which you would be keeping their data confidential, personal data confidential. So in this case, we if for any biomedical research that is conducted, we are not supposed to share any patient personal data, including you know case studies. Say uh, you know case histories. Even if it is a single patient and it's a very different and uh, very interesting uh, case history, we are not supposed to divulge the patient details. Anything else from the participants? Uh, hi, madam. Yes. Uh, uh, madam, thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, I just want to know uh, about the record keeping. Uh, in one of the case studies like you know there was like there were some charges like one of them listed uh, saying that they're not keeping a proper record uh, how important it is like uh, like i don't know like in the lab notebook um, it is very important yes, yes ma'am can you please uh, tell yes. me about it yeah i'll tell you why okay because see when you know we were doing research uh, In our early days, I would say, you know, the dates became very important. Say, for example, I create something for an intellectual property, okay? And in the US, at that point of time, they had the submarine patents. Of course, in nineteen ninety-five plus, everything changed, okay? So, in that context, the date on which you have done the experiment because it becomes important. And because at that point of time, you could go and fight saying that I did the experiment first and not he, okay? so those were the cases at that point of time but in today's context okay having lab notebooks is very important because i have say had mentioned there are cases of data fabrication there are cases of data manipulation see even if you i mean your research group has not indulged in all that but there is some particular you know uh, detail that you have uh, kind of overlooked but by not giving that information in your research article and somebody does it uh, you know same study again and they find it irreproducible because they have not mimicked the exact conditions by which you have done the experiment so there will be a radiation of you know uh, inappropriate research practice on you so at that point of time all you will have as evidence is your lab notebook so that is very important to first one is from that perspective the other one is that it is see when an uh, institution offers you infrastructure and resources to do any work okay whatever we do in the institution becomes a property of that particular institution so it is incumbent upon us to ensure that all the data including failed experiments information is noted in the lab notebook so that is key for a good lab practice thank you madam what is the authorship hierarchy for research ideas can somebody explain what is i mean this one dr prasamani rajmani kam can you explain what do you mean by this that yes. is very noisy okay okay now actually the skill set uh, is different from what the concept actually if one has the concept uh, and uh, doesn't have the skill set how to execute projects with uh, those concept and uh, what is the hierarchy of uh, contributors 
contribution like how important the person is okay so here there are two things one you need to keep in mind when you are talking of authorship hierarchy and you are talking of research ideas at the project proposal stage you may have you know different uh, uh, you know hierarchy in terms of the authorship say for example the one who has given you the idea you may uh, include her as the first author and then you may include you as the second author for the execution part of it but you have done your research you know completely and you have identified certain of the research, uh, uh, you know identified research results which are good to be communicated to the public so in that context you assess you know what is your contribution and what has been that person's contribution if in case your contribution towards execution outweighs her contribution in terms of the research idea you can claim the first authorship and then you give whoever had you you know it could be many number of students many number of other faculties who have also contributed to the research idea for execution you include all of them in the order of their contributions so that will be an assessment that you will have to make along with the you know set of people whom you would want to include as the authors for that paper okay, okay. thank you ma'am thank you welcome Yeah. Yeah. Salami. Yeah. yeah. Salami slicing of the paper. You know, let me give you an example of uh, something from organic chemistry because I'm kind of comfortable in that. See, if you are looking into you know working on the synthesis of a natural product, okay. And uh, here, uh, what you are doing is, and there's it is say about you know twelve step synthesis towards a natural product. and in that particular uh, you know scheme of things you identify two steps which are new steps that have been i know put forth by you or your group so what you do is that first thing is that because if you publish the entire natural product synthesis as one paper the importance of those two individual steps will go away so what you do is that you first create research articles for just those two papers and then you you know kind of create a paper on the entire research article on the synthesis of uh, natural products so this will you know amount to a uh, uh, kind of uh, salami slicing now the other one from a bio biomedical research perspective is that say for example you are you know considering uh, the clinical trial of say about uh, a thousand subjects from across the country okay and in that particular thing after you do all the analysis and all that say the north eastern group of our country have a different set of results okay so what you do is that you kind of slice your paper to kind of you know give that particular uh, you know uh, north eastern results alone separately and then the entire country results separately so that could amount to salami slicing unless there is a very very clear distinction between the two way which will be like you know very futuristic and towards providing a health policy uh, on the north eastern population so this will again be you know kind of amounting to salami slicing of the research article thank you ma'am was i clear on that yes ma'am yes ma'am uh, yeah okay anything else from the participants anything else from the participants if not we'll come to the end of the uh, seminar thank you ma'am thank you for providing us uh, like it's very, it's also very important every one of us have views related to moral values and ethical values but it's also important for us to be reminded of these things and this has also become a part and parcel of our curriculum too so that uh, we follow the right path in achieving our goal thank you so much for uh, uh, providing us with information related to various aspects of uh, uh, research ethics and uh, and i take this uh, opportunity to thank a trustee a uh, vice chancellor registrar director research a uh, dean vice principal and heads uh, school heads uh, faculty members and students uh, for participating in this uh, in this uh, uh, national seminar on research ethics and also and also we have a steady uh, 
I mean, the participant uh, list, which was there one hour before, you can see it still uh, in the participant list here, over here. That means uh, all are interested in this topic. And thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for inducing or uh, providing different views on this uh, research ethics topic. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, Shubha, for giving Thank me you. the opportunity. Thank you. And this will also be after uh, getting uh, approval from the authorities, this will also be uh, shared on YouTube uh, say, uh, YouTube channel for, for the extended audience. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.